It is a beautiful day, amen? Let's all stand to our feet, look to your left, look to your right, greet somebody this morning. Church, aren't you thankful that there's power in the blood?
This is a song by Chris Tomlin entitled Forever. If you know it, words will be on the screen. If you don't, feel free to sing along and it is easy to learn. forever God thank you for dying for me Lord shedding your precious blood and that all that call on your name Lord have a forever kingdom God pour out your spirit on this place thank you for already being here Thank you for all your blessings, God. Forgive me when I take them for granted. God, you're great. And I fall so short, Lord. But I do thank you for all that you are and for all that you've done for the perfect blood that was shed on that old cross. You're good, Lord. God, I just pray if there's one among us that hasn't received that free pardon of sin, Lord. Today would be the day. Stirring that soul, stirring that heart, even now, make it unmistakable the calling. 
Again, Lord, I just thank you for all that you are. Thank you for this church, for my pastor, for the word that you've given him, God, to serve up to us. And God, for those that, that have to give, Lord, thank you, Lord. May we use it in the accordance of your will, Lord God, to build up your kingdom, not ours, but yours. Again, Lord, just thank you for this day and thank you for the blessings that we're about to receive. In your son's name, Jesus, amen.
It's good to see you, church family. My wife and I had a wonderful time with our granddaughters, and uh, it's good to be back home, though. We prayed for you every day, and we enjoyed worshiping there at Stonegate Fellowship Church the last two Sundays and enjoyed the worship services here. I watched them online, and uh, I'm glad that we have that technology today and that I could do that, but we did miss being with you, and it's good to be uh, back home. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles, if you would please, to Psalm 34 this morning. Psalm 34. Now, you may have a notation in your Bible where um, I've preached from this text before, and certainly I have. It was back in 2007. In 2007, I preached from this particular passage, and the Lord has led me back to this text uh, to begin a series uh, preaching through this particular psalm. And to save time this morning, um, I, I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction and a lot of background information about this psalm until next Sunday. However, I do want to preface, uh, by way of introduction, preface the message this morning with just a few words regarding this particular psalm. It is a psalm of David. And for those of you that may not be aware of this, David was a man the Bible declares to be, have been after God's own heart. He was a man that God observed as he observes all of us. And uh, he saw that David had a heart for him. And God re showed David favor throughout his, his life, even from a, as a young lad. And if you'll recall the instance where David um, rehearses over in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and 18, where he rehearses to Saul how that God had shown him favor by giving him power over the bear and the lion as he was shepherd over the flock of sheep. And, and so David, even as a young lad, began to experience God in a very real and personal way. And here in this particular psalm, this is a psalm of David, when David was fleeing from Saul. King Saul became very jealous of David because of God's favor on David's life and, and Saul attempted many times to kill David. It was during that time that David penned this particular psalm. And so what I want you to understand this morning by way of introduction is this, that David was a man who knew what it was to face adversity. There is not a person under the sound of my voice in this service today, nor a person who will listen to this message that has not encountered adversity at one time or the other in their life. Uh, we all face it. It's not a matter of if we will face adversity, it is when. I like what James says in James chapter 1. He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers' trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He does not say, count it all joy if you fall, but when you fall. So it's not a matter of if we will experience adversity, it is a matter of when. And so you may be here this morning, you may be going through some kind of adverse circumstance or situation in your life. Or if you aren't going through something now, you may be going through something in the near future. Maybe that's why God led me to this particular psalm. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is how David responded to adversity. Now, you know, um, we can respond in different ways to adverse situations and circumstances. For example, uh, I remember Elijah. Do you remember the prophet Elijah? Uh, the Bible tells us that he had had great victory on Mount Carmel, that he had been there with the prophets of Baal, and, and how that God revealed uh, himself to to uh, all the people that were there and especially to Elijah. He had great victory on the mountain and when he came down off the mountain, a woman by the name of Jezebel heard about Elijah and she got on his case and she decided that she was going to kill Elijah. Now I want you to turn with me if you would please to um, a passage of scripture that will give us a little information here about how Elijah responded to Jezebel and to his adverse circumstances. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. And this is not our text, certainly, but we're going to go here by way of introduction. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. 
And when he saw that, he arose. That is, when, when uh, Elijah saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself, now watch this, but he himself, that is, Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. It's almost as though Elijah began to whine. Notice what he says down in verse 10. As he's uh, re re rehearsing this, he's in the cave now He's in a cave and he, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only am left and, and they seek my life to take it away. It's almost like Elijah is whining and he's, he's feeling sorry for himself after coming down off the mountain out of great victory and seeing Almighty God do a tremendous work in his life. Elijah finds himself under a juniper tree, discouraged, somewhat depressed, and even wanting to die. Now that's the way some people, that's the way some people respond to adverse circumstances or situations in their life. They allow those circumstances and situations to discourage them. They fall into deep depression and sometimes they even want to die. I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but I have. I've been there. I know what it's like to feel that way. So some people respond that way to adversity. They allow adversity to overwhelm them to a certain, listen, to the extent to where they are no longer useful for the kingdom, for God, for themselves, for their family, for anything or anyone. However, there are those who respond in a different manner. For example, turn over to the book of Job for just a moment. The book of Job, and this is a very familiar passage to those of you who study the Word of God. Job was a man that was perfect and upright and feared God and eschewed evil, the Bible says in Job 1, verse 1. And uh, so he walked with God. And uh, listen to what happened to him. Verse 14 of chapter 1. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and worshipped and said, Naked came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job turned to God. Elijah wallowed in his misery, but Job turned to God and worshipped the Lord. And he blessed the name of the Lord. That's how you and I should respond to adversity. That is how David responded to adversity. So now let's go to our main text, Psalm 34. And I want us to focus on verses 1 and 2 this morning. Let's read them together. I hope you have a copy of God's Word with you. The Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. I want you to notice this is how David responded to adversity. He responded to adversity by praising the Lord. Now, I want you to notice four things this morning about David's response to adversity. Four things about this response. Number one, I, quickly, I want you to see that it was a predetermined response. Notice what he says. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. I believe this was something that David 
resolved and fixed in his own heart long before Saul began to threaten his life. I believe David predetermined uh, when he came to know the Lord, whenever that was, I believe that as a very young man, young boy perhaps, David came to know the Lord in a very personal and real way and out of that relationship, David resolved in his own heart and in his mind that he would praise God no matter what. That when he faced whatever circumstances he faced in life, he determined that he was going to praise the Lord. That that response was a predetermined response. And I want to tell you, my dear brethren, I'm convinced that in order for you and I or for any Christian to be able to overcome the adversities of life, we must make that decision beforehand. We must decide beforehand how we are going to respond when we face adversity. We can't wait until adversity comes and then make the decision. We must decide beforehand that this is the way we're going to respond because our response as God's children is very important. Do you understand that people watch you? People watch me. And they watch to see how we're going to respond to adversity. Because our response to adversity, listen now, our response to adversity speaks volumes about what we believe about God. And David predetermined in his heart and in his mind that he was going to respond to adversity regardless of when it came, regardless of how it came. He said, I am going to respond by praising the Lord. Now, we're going to see the importance of that in just a few minutes, but it was a predetermined response. And notice he predetermined to do three things. Number one, he predetermined what he would do. He says, I am going to bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. That simply means that David resolved in his heart to, uh, listen, to adore the Lord, to bless him, to praise him. It was an act of adoration. David was going to bless the Lord, praise him, exalt him in his own heart and mind for who he is. That's something all of us need to do. He not only had a predetermined, not only did he predetermine what he would do, he predetermined when he would do it. He says, I will do it at all times. It doesn't matter when things are going great or when things are terrible. I am choosing, I am predetermining in my heart that whatever comes, I will bless the Lord. And thirdly, he predetermined how he would do it. He said, I will bless the Lord with my mouth. Look at what he says. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. He says, I am predetermining how I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to do it with my mouth. I'm going to praise him with my lips. I'm going to praise him with the tongue and the voice that God gave me. Constantly speaking of God's glories and grace. Uh, boasting of God's kindness and God's goodness. Exalting God's name for who he is. My dear brethren, it's important for you and for me and for all believers to exalt the name of God. To not, listen, never be ashamed of praising the Lord. Never be ashamed of praising him. And so his response, number one, was a predetermined response. Secondly, I want you to notice that his response was a proper response. Do you know that it is appropriate for you and for, I, for me to, to praise the Lord? It is appropriate for God's people to respond to adversity through praise of their God. Uh, look at what he says down here in, in verse 2. He says, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Psalm 147 and 1 says this. Listen to this verse. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. You know what that verse says? It says three things it, about praise. Number one, it says that praise is good. It is advantageous to you and to me and to God for you and me to praise the Lord. We are to praise him. It is also delightful. It is delightful. And thirdly, it says that it is right. It is proper. It is appropriate for us to praise the Lord. So David's response to adversity was a predetermined response. Secondly, it was a proper response. It was proper for him to bless the Lord. Thirdly, it was a persuasive response. A persuasive response. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at verse 2. 
My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. You know what that means? That means that when you and I, as God's children, began to bless the Lord and praise Him openly and publicly, do you understand that those who hear that praise are influenced by that praise? Look at what he says. He says, the humble, who are the humble? That's the lowly, the discouraged, the depressed. He says, the, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. What he's saying is, those who are around us, those humble, discouraged, depressed believers who are around us, who hear us praising the Lord, our praise is going to encourage them. It's going to influence their life. You say, in what way? Well, let me give you three ways. Number one, the lowly, the humble, the discouraged, the depressed are consoled and encouraged through praise. It makes them remember who God is in their life. Number two, the lowly and discouraged are made glad. They're made cheerful. That's what he says in the verse. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And number three, the lowly are confirmed in their trust of a faithful God. In uh, the treasury of David, I found this comment. Listen to it carefully and I quote, The confident expressions of tried believers are as rich solace to their brethren of less experience we ought to talk of the Lord's goodness on purpose that others may be confirmed in their trust in a faithful God. End of quote. Let me read that one more time. I think that's worth reading twice. Listen to this. The confident expressions of tried believers, those who have gone through the fire, those who have faced adversity, he says the confident expressions of tried believers are a rich solace comfort, if you please, to their brethren of less experience. We ought to talk of the Lord's goodness on purpose that others may be confirmed in their trust in a faithful God. That's awesome. And so when you and I begin to praise the Lord in the face of adversity, we need to have that predetermined response. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It is a proper response because it is a persuasive response. It helps those who are around us. But fourthly, I want you to see a fourth thing here. And this is what I want to settle on just for a few minutes. I'm not going to elaborate on all eight of these things. But I want you to understand that this is all, his response was also a profitable response. It was not only a predetermined response, it was not only a proper response and a persuasive response, but it was a profitable response. You say, well, why is that? Eight things, eight reasons. Get them down very quickly. Number one, it keeps one focused on God. When you and I are going through adversity and we're praising God, guess what happens? If we're praising Him, we're not thinking about our circumstances. Guess what? We're thinking about Him. We've got our focus, we've got our heart, we've got our mind focused on the Lord. So when you and I begin to praise Him, it is profitable to us in that, number one, it keeps us focused on Him. Number two, it helps one keep a proper and healthy perspective on adversity. You see, when you and I realize that, hey, God is in control of our life, He's our Lord and our Savior, He's our Master, He's our Father, Everything comes through his hands. And so God has allowed this adverse situation or circumstance to come to my life. Therefore, there's got to be a lesson learned from what I'm going through in my life. And so when we begin to take upon ourselves that perspective about our adversity, listen, it sheds a totally different light on what's going on in our life. And so it helps us when we can do that. Job, back over in the book of Job, in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, uh, after all that happened to him, listen to what happened to Job uh, in chapter 2 in verse 10. His wife, verse 9 says, uh, that it, excuse me, verse 8, Job had not only lost his family and his belongings, but Satan, God allowed Satan to go against his physical body and, and his, his body was covered with sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And the Bible tells us in verse 8 of chapter 2 that he took him a potsherd a piece of broken glass uh, to scrape himself all over. He sat down among the ashes. 
He was in severe pain. He was suffering not only emotionally and mentally, but he was suffering physically. And listen to what happened in verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou, dost thou still remain, uh, retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Just go ahead and curse the Lord. He's the one that's brought, allowed this to come on you. Why don't you curse God and die? Just let him kill you. And listen to his response. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not we receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Job had a proper perspective about what God was doing in his life. We never know when we're facing adverse circumstances and situations what God is readying us for. I'm, I firmly believe, and I, 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 I've, it's been proven in my life as a believer, not just as a pastor, but as a believer, that whatever I go through, God allows me to go through, and I'm to use it to help someone else. And I've watched that through the years of my life. I've gone through some internal struggles and, and I'd be going through some internal struggles and guess what? Someone else would come along and approach me and, and say, Pastor, I'm going through this in my life. And, I, and, and it'd be the same thing that I was going through. And I could look them in the eye and say, I understand. That's where I'm at or that's where I've been. You know, it's, it's much easier for someone to walk in someone else's shoes in order to help them. And oftentimes when people come to us, we've never walked where they're walking. It's, it, it's, it's difficult to know where, what a person is feeling or how they're feeling or what they're experiencing internally when, when we've never been there. But when we've walked where they are walking, it is, it is so much easier to be able to offer a word of encouragement or a word of comfort or a word of advice from Scripture are from something God has taught us through our adverse situation or circumstance. And so never count it as nothing. Always remember that whatever comes your way as a child of God, God has permitted it to come your way. And God will use it to His glory and to your good. Always. The Bible says that all things, not a few things, not some things, not many things, but all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, for those who are called according to His purpose. Everything works for our good. No matter what it is. And we must believe that. We must keep that perspective. For when we do face adversity, and we have that perspective, it makes all the difference in the world. It, 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 listen, it helps us. It can either make us or break us. Adversity will either make us or break us. But it really helps to have that godly perspective. Number three, very quickly, it provides a positive, positive example for others. As we've already learned from the text, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. When you and I begin to praise the Lord in the, in the face of adversity, people see the grace of God. They see the goodness of God. They see the love of God. They see the mercy of God working in and through our lives. It does influence how you and I respond, does provide either a good or a bad example for all those around us. And so it's good to go ahead and have it fixed in our heart that no matter what we experience in life, no matter what we encounter, whether it's good or bad, we're going to bless the Lord. We're going to praise Him, as David said. Number four, it establishes a pattern, a habit in our life. When you and I begin, when we purpose in our heart that we're going to bless the Lord at all times, His praise is going to continue to be in my, our mouth. And we begin to practice that on a regular basis. Guess what happens? It becomes a habit. It's a good habit to have. 
that no matter what happens, it just becomes an automatic thing. Praise the Lord. Bless God. No matter what comes, it just comes out naturally. Rather than you trying to muster it up or, or, or maybe even coming as a sacrifice of praise. People, I've often wondered, what is a sacrifice of praise? We read about it in the Bible. Have you ever thought about that? The Bible talks about a sacrifice of praise. I think a sacrifice of praise, one, one thing that I, I, I've discovered in my life, this, this is what I feel, and I, I may be as wrong as rain when you don't need it, but I'm going to share this with you anyway. I think a sacrifice of praise is when you praise God, but you really don't want to and you don't feel like it. You're making a sacrifice in your own heart to praise Him regardless of your feelings, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of what you're hearing, seeing, or feeling. You're just blessing God. You're blessing Him. And so it establishes a pattern in your life. Number five, quickly, it pleases the Father. When you and I begin to bless the Lord at all times, it pleases Him. There is nothing that pleases God any more than for His children to praise Him and to bless Him for who He is and for all that He does. Very quickly, number six, it helps maintain emotional stability. When you and I begin to bless the Lord in the face of adversity, it helps, listen, sustain us. It helps us to maintain emotional stability during those difficult times. And number seven, it fulfills the will of God. You say, what do you mean? Listen at this psalm, Psalm 150. It is a psalm of praise. Listen at this, this psalm. It says, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psalter and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. The Bible says praise him, praise him, praise him. It fulfills God's word. It fulfills God's will. I believe it even, listen, brings fulfillment to the heart of God when we begin to praise him for who he is. And finally, number eight, it brings glory to God. Our praise of God brings him glory. And that's why you and I are here. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, I think it was, that we're to be the light of the world. And we're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we're to let our light shine. And one of the ways in which we let our light shine is by praising him with our mouth, with our lips, with our voice that God gave us. We're to praise him for who he is. We're to praise him for all that he's done. We're to praise him for what he's going to do. Oh, my dear brethren, listen. This life down here is nothing. We're here temporarily, but we're going home someday. And we've got something to look forward to. We've got a place called heaven. We've got a place where the streets are paved with gold. We've got a place where there's total peace and contentment. We've got a place where there's no more sickness and no more death and no more funerals and no more dying. There's none of those things. It is a place called heaven that God has prepared for us, those of us who know him and those of us who love him. So we've got a reason to praise him. We've got a reason to praise him for who he is and for all that he's done and for all that he's going to do. Now listen carefully and in closing. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want to tell you, you can't praise God. You don't know him. How can you praise someone you don't know? How can you praise someone that you've never experienced in your life? I mean, when God begins to, when he moves into your life and he, he becomes real to you and he answers your prayers and, and uh, he, he, he lets himself, listen, he makes himself known to you in a very personal and real way. Listen, you can really begin to, to understand who he is and what he's done in your life and you can begin to praise him. But if you don't know him, you can't praise him. Oh, you can say praise the Lord or bless the Lord, but listen, it's not coming from your heart because you don't know him. You see, eternal life is a relationship with an eternal God. And apart from that relationship, one is lost and one is not saved. Now, this message this morning has been to Christians. It is not applicable to those that are unsaved, because you don't have, they don't have a relationship with the Lord. 
This was a man that knew God. This was a man that experienced God in his life and so therefore he, he knew him and he could bless him because he did know him. If you're here today and you've never met Christ, you've never met Jesus, I want to tell you, you can meet the most famous people of the world. You can meet the most kind and generous. You can have people, you can meet someone that would hand you a million dollars or two million or a billion. And you could be thankful for that. You could rejoice in that. But I want to tell you something. You'll never meet anybody like Jesus. He can give you something that no one else on this earth can give you. He can give you something that he, you cannot give yourself. He will give you eternal life. And he will give you a home in heaven. And he will give you peace in your heart. If you will only ask him and receive him into your heart and your life. As Lord and Savior. Not just Savior, but as Lord and and Savior, being willing to commit your life to Jesus Christ, a full surrender to Jesus Christ, believing that he's the Son of God, that he died on the cross for you and paid your sin debt in full. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. It's eternal death and separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you will come to Christ today, Christ will come into your life. If you will invite him in, commit your life to him, he will join hands with you and give you eternal life and change your life and change your eternal destiny. And when you die, you can go to heaven. Oh, I trust you'll make that decision if you need to make that decision today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the psalm. It is filled with rich truth. And Lord, I thank you for it. And I pray that you will help me as I study, as I prepare, as I teach your people through this psalm. Lord, help me. Give me insight into your word. Use me, Father, as your instrument to teach your people. And Father, I come now to pray for this invitation that you will bless this time of invitation, a time when we make decisions. There may be someone here today that's lost without Jesus and they need to be saved. I pray they'll come forward this morning and, and say without reservation, without hesitation, I want Jesus as my Savior. I want to be saved and I want my life changed and I want to live for him the rest of my life. Or there may be a Christian who's here today and they're going through adversity. And Lord, they don't know what to do. I pray, Lord, that you will comfort them and through this message help them Encourage them. And Lord, bless them and give them the strength they need to obey this word. To determine in their own heart and mind that they will bless you no matter what. In the midst of all that is happening in their life, they're going to praise you for who you are and for what you are doing in their life. Lord, thank you so much for this day and the privilege of being here in this service. Now bless this invitation and bless all of those that are here and those that will listen to this message. Bless the word to their hearts and help us all to abide by this word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.